Hello, welcome everybody. I'm delighted to welcome you to the second event in the Royal Academy of Engineering's Innovation in Crisis series. I'm Professor Mark Miodovnik, I'm a fellow of the Academy and Professor of Materials and Society at UCL, and I'll be the chair for this afternoon's Q&A. So this Innovation in Crisis series is a part of the Academy's response to COVID-19. The Academy's got lots of different initiatives to leverage its expertise and networks, both nationally and internationally, to help solve the challenges and assist with the public health response to COVID-19. And of course, the role of engineering is absolutely vital. Engineering is fundamentally a human activity. It's about helping humans. And hospitals basically wouldn't exist without engineering. Testing labs wouldn't exist without engineering. Communication and coordination, all the activities to do with COVID-19 just wouldn't be possible. All the things about the app, Designing and manufacturing PPE, again, it's all engineering, uh, making oxygen, delivering oxygen, breathing aids, designing and making them. And that's, that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, so the development of, of, of a new breathing aid in an emergency situation in a very rapid turnaround. I think that's the other thing to highlight here, which is that, you know, that's what engineers are good at. You know, they respond to challenges, they make decisions fast, and that's what we want to kind of to kind of unpick how did, how did it happen with this particular uh, engineering innovation, which we're going to talk about from UCL, uh, the UCL Ventura breathing aid. Um, and there, there's this series, there's already been a, uh, an event earlier in this series, uh, last week on the Nightingale Hospitals, how those were made so fast, constructed and operated uh, by engineers. And next week, or is it a week after? Sorry, I have to look for the time. I think it's on the 29th of May. Uh, it, we will be looking at uh, ventilators and, and, the, and the production and design and manufacturing of those. But this is the second in the series, and it's about, as I said before, uh, the UCL Ventura um, breathing aid, CPAP breathing aid. And we've got two people who are absolutely vital in the development of that. And uh, so you'll be able to ask them questions. I guess that's the, that's the really important part of this public event, which is that you, know, you can really ask the engineers who are at the heart of this, at the heart of saving lives, which is really what we're talking about here. Um, and, and you can ask them questions about how it happened and, and what happened. And I'm gonna, the way it's gonna work is I, I'm gonna start off with a few question and answers myself. I'm gonna ask the, the, the two panelists to introduce themselves and tell us a bit about how they got involved in this project, where it came from. Uh, and that's just sort of just paint a picture of, of an overview. And then, and then I'll, I'll do a few questions from both to kind of get it all going and to set the scene and, and, and lay it all out. And then um, I'll be looking at the question and answer um, tab. And if you're on this call, you can, it's on the bottom, it's on the bottom layer of your screen now q a it says so you can you can post questions and i can pick those up there and often with these things uh well not often but sometimes you know you get i'll get lots of questions in a row so please be patient i will try and get through them all <laughs> and i'll try and perhaps group them together into topics um, but please do post your questions uh, all the time don't wait uh, and I'll, but they i may not be able to get to them immediately okay so without further ado let me introduce or let me get my speakers to introduce themselves. So firstly, I'd like to turn to Professor Rebecca Shipley. She's Professor of Healthcare Engineering. She's Director of the Institute of Healthcare Engineering and Vice Dean for Healthcare at University College London. And I'd like to ask her to just set the scene. How did this project all start and, uh, and, and what happened next? Rebecca. Thanks, Mark. Um, and hi, everyone. Super to, to be here today and be able to discuss this with everyone. Um, so in terms of how this all started, so looking back to kind of early mid-March, um, COVID was obviously spreading and was becoming more of an emergency scenario in the UK specifically. And, and essentially there was this, this call out nationally to engineers, to industry to start thinking about how we could increase ventilation capacity um, within the NHS. Um, so at UCL, we, have, we had some really good relationships already in place to try and tackle this. So through our Institute of Healthcare Engineering, we essentially interface engineers with clinical scientists through the UCL hospitals. 
and um, we already had a really good relationship with our critical care colleagues at University College Hospital, so in particular um, Professor Mervyn Singer and Dr David Greerley, who, who ended up being the clinical leads for this initiative. Um, and then through our mechanical engineering department, we had a really strong relationship with Mercedes HPP, um, particularly through Tim Baker, who is a professor of mechanical engineering and design here. Um, so, so we kind of knew that we were in a position that hopefully we, we could contribute. Um, essentially, it all happened quite informally to start with. I gave Mervyn Singer a ring um, and Tim a ring and we all went for a drink um, one evening just as, just as lockdown was really coming in and starting so we could still go for a drink at that point but only for another couple of days um, and we started chatting about from a critical care perspective what they felt was really needed in terms of increasing capacity within the UK. Now um, Mervyn Singer has a really extensive um, network of intensivist colleagues internationally so he had been talking to the intensivists in China in, in Italy Lombardy region for example and understanding their, what, what their experiences were and, and what their understanding was of the, the need in terms of ventilation capacity. And that was obviously to be able to increase our ability to mechanically ventilate patients, but also they were finding that um, non-invasive ventilation using these devices called CPAPs, which are continuous positive airway pressure devices, had played a really significant role. So CPAPs um, seemed to be alleviating around 50 to 60% of patients who needed critical care for COVID from progressing to mechanical ventilation. So Mervyn essentially said, we need more non-invasive um, respiratory aids um, and, and, um, and we got thinking. So, so we went back to um, some historical devices that had been used very widely um, and that we thought we could reverse engineer and manufacture quite quickly. And um, Tim essentially rang Andy and the, and the Mercedes teams and asked if they would be up for, for working together, um, which Andy's response was, do not hesitate to call on the might of what we can do, which was a pretty fantastic response to have at that time. And the next day, um, some of the team from Mercedes turned up at UCL and we started working. Thanks, Rebecca. Okay, so you've sort of set the scene. So, you know, and I think that's what you've highlighted is, is a really important engineering skill, which is find the right problem to solve. First of all, ask the clients, ask what they really need uh, and, and talk to the people on the front line. And I think that's just such an important thing to do. It had turned out to be absolutely pivotal. Um, and, that, and that sort of networking social side of engineering is just not to be underestimated. Um, so Andy, what happened when you got the call? Can I hand over to you and tell us what, what happened next? Yeah, good afternoon, Mark. Um, hello, everybody. Um, uh, yeah, following on from uh, Rebecca's uh, conversation, unfortunately, we missed out on the trip to the pub. Um, but um, uh, I think it was about four of the, the engineers on, the, on a Wednesday afternoon, and it was the Wednesday after the Australian GP had been cancelled on the, uh, the, the weekend before. Um, so four of the engineers went down to, to UCL and spent a, a, a two or three days down there. Um, they came back wearing pink t-shirts because they'd, um, uh, they'd, they'd finished with the use of their work shirts. Um, but what they'd sent up um, to the factory were the, were the provisional drawings. Um, this, uh, this, this flow device, um, uh, uh, you know, the UCL team quite rightly um, worked out that to react quickly it needs to be a simple device it needs to be something where we we copy something that used to be used um, and and we managed to buy one on eBay on the on on the Wednesday evening and we uh, uh, by 10 o'clock in the morning it was in our CT scanner um, and then we set up a test rig um, and then we were disassembling it and looking at the tooling required to disassemble um, and we were um, we were very quickly into the whole engineering process of um, detailed design, um, analysis of materials, analysis of the tooling that's required, analysis of, um, of, of, of test equipment so that you can pass off and know that what you've created is, um, is good and you can identify any issues. Um, it, was, uh, it was, and it was all following on from 
uh, the Formula One community setting up a group called Project Pitlane. Um, so the seven UK based Formula One teams and their technology partners had, had got together in the days before and said, look, if there's any opportunities for us to help, we'll club together. We'll, we'll collaborate together and use our combined strength. Um, and we ended up supporting three projects. Um, this being um, this being one of them, with uh, with Mercedes taking the uh, the lead role and the lead liaison with with UCL, um, and I guess the final step, you know, making a making a prototype, making a rapid prototype is what Formula One is all about, and going racing and and being successful with that innovation. Uh, but this had the the challenge of volume, um, you know, this had the challenge of ten thousand devices. Normally, we only make a hundred engines in a year. Um, but 10,000 devices, and we quickly worked out that it needed to be 1,000 a day because the, the virus wasn't going to wait for us to make these, these, these parts. And so repurposing the factory to make something new, but also making it 1,000 a day, that was, uh, that was a huge part of the challenge. But um, uh, the, the overwhelming viewpoint in the factory was that everybody wanted to help everybody wanted to lend their skill set lend their um their time their energy to it um and it was uh it, it was a tremendous journey to be honest and um it was uh it, it was hugely reward rewarding working with ucl and um and rebecca and tim and and characters like mervyn singer who you know he, he's the one that identified what's required and and you know together with tim as you as you point out mark you know identified this is the solution this is what we should chase so as you as i was explaining that and ben hodgkinson was explaining that to people in this factory it was um people got it straight away and the and the human desire to help fight the virus was uh, was there and providing a huge amount of energy i think what struck me andy if i can just continue with a question is that um <laughs> Uh, it was all about time, as you, as you kind of alluded to. We could see that, you know, there's going to be this peak and it was going to be in about two weeks time from the lockdown moment. And everyone was, and we could see the Italians were, were struggling with this and, and we could see the chaos in their hospitals. And, and here, here was a device which, which promised to kind of alleviate or in fact get rid of that peak if, if, it, if it could be made, you know, 10,000 and, and distributed to all NHS hospitals in time in two weeks. I think, I mean, my God, surely when you, when you really thought of that, you must have thought, is that, is that at all possible? Like, can we do it? I mean, how, how did you kind of assess as a team that that was actually doable? Um, I, I think the, uh, uh, once you know what you're trying to create, and that was, um, that, that was the first task, then you just look at how many minutes are there in the day and how long is it possible um you know how long does it take to assemble a valve how long does it take to make something um and and then you just set production lines up in parallel um and and we weren't short of people in the factory that wanted to help um and also the supply chain um the supply chain that, that we normally use um uh, was extended a little bit uh, to suit the design of the parts um and uh, and and it, we, we, we made the prototype um, using all our internal manufacturing um, capability and we made 12 sets of bits. Um, and then we decided we'd make 100 off, but that would be focused on uh, testing the supply chain's ability to make 1,000 per day. So, so every step along the way, we were doing the, the development, the prove out for what we could see as the next step. And I think if, you, if you've got a, a, a great idea at the start and you know what success is at the end, which was making 10,000, you know, 1,000 a day, you, you, can, you can chart the journey and you can break it up into steps and you can put, um, you know, you, you, it, it's easy to sell this sort of a, a journey because everybody wanted to, to do it. Everybody could see the news. Everybody could see what was happening in Italy and nobody wanted that to happen um, in, in, in UK hospitals. Um, so, so, you know, what's the total journey? Break it up into steps. Um, a, a ridiculously easy project in terms of getting support and so on. Um, and, and, but some, uh, so some real tenacious work throughout that, throughout that journey, you know, the UCL team, you know, working through the, uh, working through the night to get stuff done and the medical approval as well. You know, Rebecca was 
um, right at the centre of that medical approval, without which, um, you know, we'd have been making ornaments rather than something that could be used. Yeah, maybe that's a good moment to go back to you, Rebecca. So, so here, so, so you, 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 you were sure that this was going to be something that wouldn't, was an important part of the COVID response. Uh, and, and at first, I mean, this is an existing device. So um, these CPAP devices. So, so I guess your first question was, can we just buy them? I mean, uh, what, what happened when you first realized that, you know, the hospitals needed 10,000? Um, wh why did you go down the route of, well, we're going to have to make them? Yeah, so, so I think we realized very, very quickly that we were going to have to make them. So, so when we first met, and I think even with that first meeting, when we, when we were chatting to Mervyn um, and his team, so, so we were talking about what devices they had available at University College Hospital, which is obviously just one hospital in the, in the NHS network, but it, it's one of the largest in the UK. So I think at that time, they were obviously repurposing their capacity to provide intensive care to as many patients as possible. And I think at that time, they had um, thought through that planning process and they were able to, to provide um, around 180 intensive care beds from memory um, and potentially get get up to 180 ventilators. Um, but at that time, they only had around 20 CPAP devices um, in the trust. But talking to colleagues in the Lombardy region, there were around 2,000 people on CPAPs at that time. So there was obviously this really big mismatch between the number of um, non-invasive devices that may well be needed, and that if we could supply them, would provide significant patient benefit and planning benefit to the NHS. So, so one of the advantages to CPAPs is that um, people are, are on them for less time. So there's, in terms of optimizing bed numbers, there was a, there was a contribution there. And also they're less sophisticated um, devices than mechanical ventilators. So in terms of staff training, there's a significant advantage. Um, so, so we did start looking about whether you could just buy these up and, um, but, but fundamentally they're just, you know, the UK wasn't a manufacturer obviously there was a massive international shortage. So the solution really was to try and make them. And I think that was true of the CPAP devices themselves, which are the, the flow generating devices that plug into the, the hospital and um, the pipe oxygen supply. But they come with other components as well. So an oxygen analyzer, which basically tells you the concentration of oxygen that you're supplying to the patient and the breathing circuits, which are a combination of masks and pipes and valves and filters. So we had to take the same approach with, with all of those components, really. So we needed to manufacture the oxygen analyzers too, for example. Um, but it, was, it was really a case of looking at what manufacturing capability we already had within the UK and then understanding how we could repurpose that or refocus that to, to supply this very specific need and within a very short period of time. The other aspect of it, though, Rebecca, so having made that calculation, phoned up Andy, got that whole lot involved you still had to also then what if we're going to re we're going to make a version we're going to have to get it uh you know medically approved right and that and and how did you work out that that's going to be possible in the two-week time frame because otherwise again it wasn't going to work and yeah. how did you make how did you get that to happen yeah so so that was really something that we started thinking about again from that first meeting so obviously we knew that if we were going to medical make a medical device it was, it was going to need MHRA approval and that obviously that was an absolutely fundamental step to ensure the safety and efficacy of the device and, and that is again why we started at the place that we did. So, so we started from a Philips, Whisperon, um, Philips um, Respironics Whisperflow CPAP device which was a purely mechanical device um, that was off patent and that had been used very widely in the NHS and internationally up to about 15 years ago. So they were still kind of knocking around in hospitals. We found a couple at ECH in um, various cupboards covered in cobwebs. Um, um, but essentially we knew that if we started from an existing device that had been previously CE marked but was off patent, then the first step with the MHRA would be to demonstrate like for like. Um, so that was a, a really key decision point, um, which as I said was, the, the main contributing factors there were that it was a simple mechanical device which would enable the kind of rapid prototyping and mass manufacture, but also that the first step with the regulator would be demonstrating like-for-like -like in terms of performance and function. 
So that's what we focused on. So our first submission to the MHRA was um, a demonstration of all of the the, um, the matching between our UCL Ventura device and the original whistleblow. We then moved on from that first submission very quickly to think about oxygen utilisation because the, the whistleblows were um, relatively oxygen hungry. Obviously, oxygen was a particularly limited precious um, commodity, so we don't have an infinite oxygen capacity within hospitals. So anything that we could do to minimise that oxygen utilisation would be really beneficial in terms of rolling out their mass use within, within hospitals and, and helping hospitals with their oxygen planning. So the UCL mechanical engineering teams, together with Mercedes, did um, some careful thinking there around essentially redesigning um, components of the entrainment port to minimise the oxygenization of the device and then also thinking about the specific operation of the breathing circuits, so the, the combination of filters and um, um, tubing mask etc and characterising their oxygen and flow, um, oxygen flow and pressure characteristics um, specifically again to minimise oxygen utilisation and once we've done that we again submitted that to the MHRA. So, so Rebecca, so this is a series of prototypes, which, which, uh, so it's evolving. Uh, yeah. You're submitting data to MHRA. Uh, meanwhile, Andy's ramping up his capacity. At some point, you have to converge on one. You, know, you have to sort of call time, I suppose, on, on the innovating the Ventura de the device, yeah. and say, look, this is this may not be the perfect device, but this is we need to we need to set go to Andy. And, and Mercedes and say, this is a device we want 10,000 of. So what kind of time frame are we talking about? Can you give us a sort of, because we're talking about this is a two week thing. <laughs> so how, how far are we through the two weeks before, before the Ventura device design is settled yeah. and you've got approval? So from our first meeting, which was going to the pub for a pint with Mervyn and Tim and myself, and from that meeting, I think we had the first prototype um, testing it in the hospital, which is the other critical part that we, this, this testing had to be done in the hospital setting. So that kind of collaboration across the team was really key again. So we were testing it within a hospital um, within a hundred hours. So, so Andy got very good at basically jumping in the car, driving down in the evening. And we all set up basically uh, in one of the floors of the, of the hospital, which at that point was empty and doing that testing. So we started that within a within hundred hours of that first meeting. We submitted to the MHRA and had approvals within 10 days. And then what was also going on at the backdrop here was that there was a, a whole evolution of the kind of um, national perspective and NHS perspective around ventilation. So initially the, the priority had been around mechanical ventilation. And then there was a kind of simultaneous effort that was ongoing that we were very much part of around um, basically, the NHS changed its care pathway for COVID patients and CPAP was added to that on the 28th of March, which was 10 days in, which was pretty much exactly when we got our MHRA approvals. So there was that kind of lobbying kind of policy component going on at the same time. Um, and then we were moving very quickly to the, the oxygen utilisation minimisation problem. Um, and having simultaneous conversations with the cabinet office and the Department of Health. So at that point, it was all kind of simultaneous. Obviously, we weren't going to mass manufacture the devices that were the Mark 1s because we knew that we could significantly improve on oxygen utilisation. Um, and that oxygen utilisation was improved by up to 70%, depending on the operating point that you're looking at. Um, and obviously, they were then the devices that we, that we took forward for mass manufacturing. Thank you, Rebecca. That's great um, to get that sense. Maybe, of maybe I... Yeah, Andy, just come in and yeah. tell us um, about your, your side of that. Yeah, Rebe Rebecca refers to sort of the, uh, the drives down to, to, to London, um, empty streets. So the drive down was, um, uh, was, was clear. Um, <laughs> but uh, it, it was very interesting for, uh, for Ben Hodgkinson and myself to experience those, um, those uh, well patient tests, which is where uh, Mervyn and Dave were, were stepping forward and, and, and trying it. And that's where, you know, as, as, as engineers, you realize it's not just the flow device, it's the whole system that needs to work together. And collaborating with, with Tim, we set up a rig here to do flow tests on the filters, on the, on the, on the peak valves to make sure that the, 
the total flow was manageable with reasonable pressure drops. Um, and uh, Rebecca refers to there you know, 70% improvement in, in, in oxygen gain. Part of that came from the simulation team that would normally be designing inlet ports and plenums and compressors for a Formula One engine. They were set the task of improving the, the fluid flow through the jet pump part of the, the flow device. Um, so it was, it, 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 it was given, you know, Formula One engineers and the tool set that they would normally use, you know, under the guidance of UCL. But with Ben and I watching these tests and seeing what was important and listening to Tim and Mervyn and Rebecca talk about, yeah, but this is what's needed. Um, and that's where that sort of, you know, team coming together, collaborating, listening, learning, ideas sparking off, going away, talking, then coming back together two days later. It's that, it's that rapid development innovation cycle. Um, and, and often it's the case that you don't fully know what the journey is going to entail. You, you've got the start, you've got the end, but every single step along the way, that there's always new stuff. Um, Andy, but I, I can't help but think it must be something to do with being a Formula One manufacturer that allowed your team to be able to cope with that uncertainty and the short time frames and still be confident. I think, I mean, what is it about, is, I mean, it is, it is a special environment, isn't it, the Formula One environment with those sort of pressures and, and the quick turnaround. I suppose that must have really helped. Yeah, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a highly competitive environment um, with technology pushed to the uh, to the to the boundaries um, and you need to innovate quicker than your opponent to uh, to win um, and so that um, that group of engineers that were you know primed and ready for the 2020 Formula One season um, were were so hungry to work on this um, the, um, and the, the tool set that was available here was um, uh, was free because Formula One has been in, in shutdown for a period of time. Um, so it was, you know, where, where, when there's the need, when there's the skill set, when there's the passion, that's when it, you know, it's, it, it's not hard to make progress. The, I guess the hard thing is to, to corral that energy in the right direction so that you don't go off all scatterguns that you, that, you know, you, 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 walk, you walk a sensible path and you're thinking ahead a little bit and getting yourself ready for the next step. Andy, I've got some specific questions from, <coughs> from, uh, from our viewers. I'm just going to run a few past you first. And then there's a few other questions I'd like Rebecca to have a go if that's possible. Uh, but for you, uh, Andy, we've got questions coming in about the specific uh, manufacturing technologies you used. So what, what were the key, the key uh, tools and um, um, manufacturing kind of processes they used in making the Ventura. Yeah, it, it, it's it's a it's a relatively simple mechanical device, to be honest. Um, the the main body um, of the device is made from a, a, an engineering um, plastic, um, and we um, repurpose the five-axis machining centres that we have here in Brixworth. So instead of machining pistons and turbocharger parts, we we put those to one side and the Manufacturing engineers uh, reprogrammed and re retooled the machines to, um, um, to 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 turn you know chunks of of plastic into perfectly machined um, bodies um, with with a very defined um, cycle time because they knew they needed to meet a thousand a day. Um, and then um, several of our outside suppliers were were making the um, the valves um, three. Um, uh, needle valves um, in the in the device, uh, an on-off valve, a flow valve, and, a, and an oxygen valve, and they're um, you know finely turned um, stainless steel valves. Um, and there it was a challenge of making sure that the drawing tolerances were robust enough with maximum metal on, minimum metal on, and would still go together. Um, uh, Formula One is very much focused around making a few and having a lot of craftsmen involved in looking after the way it goes together. We knew that if we were making a thousand a day, it really did need to go together right first time. And so the quality engineers did a great job of uh, working with the outside supply chain on that. Andy, um, Helen's asking how 
you know, you're talking about craftsmen. I, I think we all have some sort of mental image of a Formula One. In fact, I've actually visited, so I know, I know what it looks like. And it's sort of an absolute clean room. It, it's so spotless. You've never seen yep. anything quite so spotless. Um, but uh, there's a question from Helen here about how you stop people kind of get too many people getting in the way. How did you focus? How do you make the design decisions? Uh, was that an issue at all? I, I, I don't think so. The, you know, the, there's, there were lots of, um, uh, lots of volunteers um, and we very much reached for those, uh, those volunteers when the, when, the, when the engineering and development and manufacturing program got to the, the step where their skill set would be useful. Um, but largely it was, it, it, it was reaching for the people that we, we knew had the right personality and knowledge of our business and would apply themselves well. Um, the, the guy that set up our test rig, a um, guy called Stuart Lever, he's, he's one of the most impressive development engineers of you know, internal combustion engines that I've, I've ever come across. Um, he, he got the whisper flow device that we, um, uh, we bought on the Thursday morning and Thursday evening he was using his home rapid prototype machine to make some adapters because he, he couldn't find them in the factory and he knew that ordering them would take longer than him making them himself. Um, and, and when you know you've got characters like that with that sort of can do, you know, I will get there in time attitude, um, you, you reach for those individuals. So it's, um, it's trying to know the style and approach of the, of the individuals and the skill set and the needs of the program and, and bringing all that together. I guess it's just a testament to the people. You know, it's people management as much as it is technical management, isn't it? It really is both. Uh, engineering has to, has, to, has to bring forth. Thanks, Andy. I'm just going to hand over to, to Rebecca for a minute, ask a few questions on the... Um, so we've got a question here from Jay Gilroy about the clinical data coming off this. Now, presumably there is clinical data coming from the treatment of many thousands of patients. Uh, is, that, is that now evolving the design? Uh, and... and, and um, also, uh, another question here, which is sort of related, which is, you know, how did it work when you were getting regulation? How, how in touch were they? How worried were they that the data was, that you were giving them was only a sort of very sh a small amount of data to, to regulate a device that basically people's lives depended on? Yeah. Um, so I'll take the regulator one first and, I'll, and then I'll skip back to, to what we're up to now in the NHS distribution. So in terms of the regulator, so the MHRA is operating under a specific emergency scenario for COVID. So, so it's, not, it's not kind of business as usual for the MHRA. Um, I would say they've been absolutely phenomenal. So I think we, we had our first meeting of the team on the Tuesday. On the Thursday, I first contacted the MHRA. And I think, you know, from that point onwards, um, it's a chap called Neil Maguire there who's been kind of leading on non-invasive ventilators for the, for the MHRA. I, I think I spoke to him most days from then onwards. So it was, it was really very much a collaboration, I would say. So they were providing constant input and advice, um, which meant that, you know, really facilitated the moving at speed. In terms of, you know, the, you know obviously, there's no kind of relaxation in terms of standards, in terms of safety, um, for example. Again, the fact that we were reproducing or reverse engineering the device that had been widely used obviously put us from a strong start point. So there was widespread you know, clinical data on the whisper flows. Um, so we, we, we had to provide a lot of data and information to them and, and also things about the quality management systems and process and um, traceability and all these kind of things which you would normally include in a full MHRA submission were all in there. So, so we did all of that anyway. Um, um, in terms of kind of where we, where we got to and what we're up to now, so I mean we made, so Mercedes made the 10,000 of the devices by the 15th of April which was the order that we got from the Department of Health They've now, they are going out to, to hospitals, so over 60 hospitals in the NHS network have them now, and that includes England, um, Ireland, Scotland, Wales, but also um, Crown Dependencies and Overseas Territories, so Isle of Man, Jersey, and Montserrat. Um, and we're, we're collating all the data. Obviously, that's not easy to do. So, so the process that we went through is that we got the MHRA approval. We then did a clinical evaluation across UCLH and sister hospitals. So that was a relatively small study um, and um, we've provided those data back to the MHRA. We have a reporting process up and running which is for reporting adverse events and equipment failures um, and 
and um, that's all established. Then at the moment, we're basically collating all of the data from UCLH, ICU in particular, over the COVID surge. Um, so that's a, that um, is enabling us and will, will enable us as, as we publish it to, to really make clear the, um, the impact of the strategy of um, non-invasive ventilation versus mechanical ventilation. I've got a question here from Helen Ewells, who's, who's asking about this interaction with the Department of Health and the Cabinet Office. Uh, you know, did that did that work well? Uh, I guess I guess it was all emergency stuff. Or how how was that for you as an engineer trying to resp you know an, you know essentially an academic suddenly coming to the forefront of a, of a national emergency? That must have been quite a, a journey. And how was it for you? Um, it it was quite a journey, um, definitely. So so um, massive kind of credit and to Professor David Lomas here, who is he's the vice provost for health at UCL, and and he. Kind of spearheaded a lot of the the kind of lobbying work that we were doing. So so you know essentially we we obviously made contact with the with the cabinet office and the Department of Health. Um, we initially got an order for a hundred of them through, which was to do kind of the first evaluation phase, if you like. Um, and, and as we were making those and testing those, and obviously the surge was coming, we then started having very regular meetings with the Department of Health, which which are ongoing. So we're still having those meetings. Um, and you know, obviously, again, the pace was very quick. So we moved from the order for a hundred to um, one evening. We were, we had a meeting with them, and um, you know, it turned to an order of ten thousand, which which was um, uh, an evening I won't remember, I won't forget in a hurry for like that. Um, um, and that was really kind of the culmination of all of the the work we'd done up to that point. So we were we were less than two weeks in at that point. And um, it had been an incredibly intense two weeks of kind of continuous development, MHRA work, testing, evenings in the hospital, kind of you name it. So, so that was a real um, um, line in the sand moment, I think, where we just shifted to being entirely focused on getting them out to the NHS as soon as possible. Thanks, Rebecca. Uh, Andy, I've got an, a, a question from you from Harish. Uh, Krishna Murphy, he says, is the device targeted only the UK? Is the supply ch chain being delivered to other parts of the world considered? And does Mercedes Global Presence support to make this device accessible across the globe? I mean, how, how much are you involved in, in the kind of open sourcing of this device? Uh, um, it, that's a great question. Um, the, uh, I, I guess our whole motivation was to, was to help the, the, the UK NHS um, system. Um, but when um, news first broke on the on the BBC on on whichever Monday it was, I can't remember now. But uh, on a, on a Monday morning, news broke that you know that initial MHRA approval had been achieved, and the um, and UCL were looking to to start the the, the clinical trials. Um, the the number of people that that made contact was was incredible. Um, both, you know, um, friends and colleagues saying, you know, well done for what you're working on, but then also uh, around the globe saying, well, can, 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 can you help? Can you make them for us? Can you make the engineering information available? Um, it was one of those, it was one of the easiest decisions, to be honest, to make the engineering um, information available. You know, if you've got the opportunity to help everybody, um, then then that's that's way, way better than just, just helping one country. Um, and so we, we swiftly worked to... Um, uh, to review all the engineering data, um, one of the things we'd already done was create a uh, a document a report that did a compare and contrast between the original whisper flow and the device that we'd created on on the reverse engineering program. We just kept adding to that, so we made sure that the drawings were um, to a good enough standard to go to the open world and the CAD models and the assembly instructions and the test instructions and and so on so the every single bit of engineering information that we'd got we we put that together for the patient circuit we put a generic um schematic together and the pressures versus flow rates um, um that were required for the system to work um and then um rebecca with the commercial people in in mercedes worked together to make sure that that data could could go open source but in a controlled way uh, where people apply for licenses so that we've got um 
uh, it is not just scattered far and wide in an uncontrolled way. Um, and that was, um, that, 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 I guess that was the, the next step of sort of, you know, great reward for the whole team here as, as everything went, went worldwide with the opportunity to help everybody. Um, we know there are, that, um, the, the, the Daimler R and T teams in, in Stuttgart. Are making as, as Andy said, we release the designs through a control. An extensive list, and, and then they're going now, obviously, going through the process of um, understanding their local supply chains and capacity to manufacture. And we're working with various international organisations to provide some support around that. So organisations like DFID and like WHO, for example. So anyone can go to the UCL website and find these plans. And, and if you've got, I mean, there is some checking that goes on to make sure you're a bona fide organisation who has the capacity to manufacture. I guess one of the risks you're worried about on that front is just that they might end up with someone manufacturing it incorrectly and then uh, putting lives at risk. I mean, how, yeah. how did you risk assess that? Um, we basically, we, we've, I guess, in a kind of in a fundamental sense, we decided that it was it was the right thing to do to release the designs um, because our motivations were that this should be available to anyone to be able to help the kind of international response to COVID. As Andy said, the approach was really to release every piece of information and every detail that we could, so complete transparency over every aspect of the designs, the testing protocols, the bench testing, the, the data, the performance data that the devices should meet, um, down to you know, time on each part of the, the rig, et cetera, like that, so that we were completely transparent. We, it did obviously have to put legal processes in place because even though we're releasing it for free, um, things we needed to consider things like liability, and we've also got a clause in there that, that basically prevents people from making a profit out of the design. So there were various aspects there that we had to think about very carefully, um, which we did through the support of the, the legal teams at UCL and, and Mercedes. Uh, uh, Rebecca, there's a few questions that I keep asking about the kind of any clinical data we have at the point. I, I guess it's very hard to have actual real peer reviewed data now, but is there a sort of sense of how many people have been treated with these devices so far? And, and how effective the CPAP route has been for the UK yeah. not, not being overwhelmed. Uh, how, how, what's its impact in that? Um, so we don't have the collation of all the national data yet, that's still kind of pending, but I can talk a bit about the UCLH data if that's helpful. So I think at UCLH, um, specifically within the ICU there, um, they've been analysing the data for patients that needed respiratory support beyond an oxygen mask. So basically patients that were progressing to needing an intervention that would either be a mechanical ventilator or a non-invasive ventilation device. Um, and essentially what we're seeing there is that based on um, just shy of 200 patients that have gone through um, the UCLH ICU, about 50% um, well, so, so they, you know, they prioritise CPAP, they're quite a kind of CPAP um, centre, if you like, and the, the patients that have been on CPAP, 50% of those haven't progressed to needing mechanical ventilation. So essentially for those patients, they avoided needing progressing to that point, which is, which is good for the patients. Um, so if you're mechanically ventilated, you're sedated, um, you have a, you know, a tube down that, um, into your lungs um, and the, the ventilator breathes for you. Um, there's, you're usually ventilated for weeks, so up to five weeks for COVID, and the, the kind of journey to recovery is very long. Um, um, and, you know, the NHS is seeing that now in terms of the rehabilitation supports that's needed. For CPAPs, the kind of mean length, of, or the median length of a, um, a treatment is, is more like eight days, and, you know, you're awake, you're not sedated, etc. so the recovery path is easier. So, so as I said, about 50% of the patients at UCLH ICU um, haven't progressed to become ventilated because of this. Thank you. Um, we've, so I think we've covered 
most of the aspects that we can in this event. I, I want, I'm just going to sort of ask you both for sort of final comments. Um, I mean, of course, this is ongoing, so this is not final as in terms of this project, but just in terms of today. Uh, I, I think I would like to start with Andy. You've got a couple of questions which, which you can answer or not answer, but that are sort of like that. One of which is from Alexander Smythe, who, or Smith, sorry, I, I'm not sure how to pronounce that. Uh, which is about what do you miss most about this responsive madness? <laughs> and uh, another question about uh, what, hold it, uh, okay, yes, Helen. Helen wants to know what you've learned through this project that would change how you do normal projects in the future. Although I, I, I think, I suppose I feel like Formula One is probably like this, but Andy, and uh, first Andy and then Rebecca, do you want to kind of respond to those questions and anything else you want to sort of say to sum up today? I think um, uh, it, 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 it was a huge privilege to work uh, to work on this project. Um, huge, hugely rewarding. Um, uh, and if if just one patient was helped, then it then it was all worthwhile. And it was considerably more than one patient that's been that been helped in this country. Um, and hopefully, there are patients around the world being helped by this by this work. Um, I think the thing that we've learnt is that. Um, uh, having a different program within our factory um, with, with, with different attributes to our normal program is a good way of learning about every single skill set, every single department. Um, you know, every single drawing was relatively simple to create and therefore any corrections that needed to be made, any bits of learning either in design, simulation or manufacturing, you, you couldn't blame high complexity for the reason for a correction being made. Um, and, so, and so you learn, yeah, doing something different through your normal process uh, with your normal skill set, every single issue that you learn, there's opportunity to compare and contrast with, with the normal program. So everywhere, design, simulation, purchasing, quality, manufacturing, assembly, um, management, every single one of us learnt from this program. Um, we're capturing that and we will apply it to the way that we do our normal uh, motorsport and high performance business work. Um, and what we've also learnt is that there's a huge um, number of crossovers with the, with the medical world. You know, as you, as you introduced, engineering's everywhere. <clears throat> Um, and this project um, uh, enabled us to, uh, to to meet some influential people, some knowledgeable people in the in the medical engineering world, and opened our eyes to uh, the type of work that goes on. Um, and so it, it shows that our skill sets are, can be applied into this world in a, in a useful way. Um, and so why not carry on? Why not look to do more of this work? Um, we now know who to talk to. We can call uh, we can call Rebecca and David instead of them calling calling me. Um, uh, and um, and and we can use our skills for the medical world as well as the the, the high performance world. Thanks, Andy. Um, <laughs> uh, I'll just hand over to Rebecca, and then I'll sort of thank you both and, and close. Rebecca, any final remarks from you? you, you? Uh, what will you do differently? Do you miss, or are you presumably still in the kind of madness? Are you? Uh, no, it's it's not quite the same level of madness or intensity. But I'm I'm at UCL still. We are we're still working on on various aspects. So we're, we've been doing a lot of work around the the hoods and the patient circuits and trying to optimise them further and think about patient comfort. And um, we're obviously doing a lot of work around the international piece at the moment too. So support of local manufacturing in lower middle income countries and international supply so there's certainly still plenty going on i think just to echo what andy said it's um it's been it's been an immense privilege to work on the project i don't think that you know if anyone had asked us at the beginning where we'd end up we couldn't have really anticipated that and um, it's an experience that i think i'll always remember but i think you know, for me, the most the most amazing part of it has really been the people and the teams. So, you know, and I think that's what I'll really be taking away from it is is the strength and um, what you can do really when you have all the right pieces of expertise together. So that was, you know, talking to the clinical teams and understanding the hospital environment through to the, the mechanical engineers and the, you know, the manufacturing capability, the regulators, the lobbying, it's kind of the full, the full piece, if you like, and um, 
and, and as Andy said earlier, everyone has been just so incredibly motivated to, to contribute that it's been a really kind of unique situation where it was, it, it didn't take any effort to kind of get people on the same trajectory, if that makes sense. So mm. you know, that's been phenomenal. Yeah, well, thank you. I mean, I think what I've learned talking to you both today and also observing uh, some of the project myself is just that, um, you know, what, what British engineering is, <laughs> if, if there's a flavor of engineering that is British engineering, this is, this is the epitome of it, which is that people just go, this needs to be done and we're going to do it. And we're going to connect with the people we need to connect with to make it happen. And without knowing each other, immediately gel as a team to get it done and they, 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 but also just be the highly talented people around who know everything about this um and being able to gel it's very it makes you very proud to be a british engineer and i, I have to say real credit to you all and really really i'm sure all our viewers and listeners are thinking exactly the same thing and we're getting loads of messages to that effect so well done to both and to all the other people i know who are involved in the team Tim Bake in particular, who's incredibly instrumental, and all the medics from UCLH. Uh, you know, it, you know, it's, you know, we teach engineering at UCL, and, and we always say to the students, you know, first of all, talk to your clients, right? Don't just go off and design some amazing thing. First, talk to your clients, ask them what they need, and that's that's what we did, and that's that's how uh, that's how you as a project team managed to get from naught to ten thousand devices helping the NHS in two weeks, which I think is just an incredible achievement. So well done you two, well done everyone on the team. Uh, I'm gonna just say that, thank, thanks for everyone to listening into this and for all your questions. Sorry I haven't managed to get to all of them. Uh, there have been so many questions and it, it's been very interesting to, to try and get through some of them. Um, this, is, this is the second in the series of innovation uh, talks and uh, there is a third, which is next Friday the 29th. Oh, I got the date right. Next Friday, the 29th of May, 3.15 p.m., so put that in your diary. <laughs> and um, I, I'll be discussing the, the Ventilator Challenge UK Consortium with uh, Dick Elsie, who's the Chief Executive of the High Value Manufacturing Catapult, and Graham Aura, who's, uh, who's Executive Director of, uh, of Ford. And, um, you know, you can sign up to these events. You click the link. Uh, there'll be a follow-up email which will allow you to do that uh, and we will have other topics and sessions for future sessions uh, no doubt so keep in touch with us um, so yes it just it remains today thank you to Rebecca and uh, thank you to Andy um, thanks for giving us your time and for all what you've done thanks for the whole Royal Academy of Engineering team who put this on they've been brilliant too uh, and thank you all for listening and for tuning in on a sunny day uh, when you could have been in your garden. <laughs> Maybe you are in your garden. <laughs> anyway, um, uh, so long. See you next time. <laughs>